Welcome everyone to our Canadian Diabetes Association National Webinar Series. My name is Farah Ismail and I'm a Program Manager here at CDA and I will be your host for today. We are absolutely delighted that you're able to join us for our webinar to learn all about the importance of why we should exercise. Um, to start us off, I would like to draw your attention to the survey that's located at the top right-hand section of your screen. In order to better serve your needs, we do kindly ask that you provide us with your input by completing the short survey towards the end of the presentation. And we thank you in advance for your input. Throughout the presentation, you will have the opportunity to type in the Q&A box, and that's located at the bottom right-hand section of your screen. And we ask that you use this box for any questions you have along the way, and our presenters will be happy to answer them at the end of the presentation, time permitting. As well, we will be displaying a few polling questions throughout the presentation and would love for your participation in the questions. And it's really there to gauge our audience who our audience members are. And please note that your responses are completely anonymous. Also note that you are able to customize your screen and you can expand and collapse them. So feel free to adjust them as needed by dragging down the bottom right hand corner. The presentation itself will probably be 40 minutes to 45 minutes in length, and we'll have about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for a question and answer period. It's also important to note that our session today will be recorded, and it will be made available to you on our Canadian Diabetes Association's website. So to get us started here, I wanted to start off with a polling question. Um, so if everyone, can, if everyone can participate, that would be great. Um, is this your first webinar with the Canadian Diabetes Association? And so I'll give you guys just a few seconds to respond. Okay, and I guess we'll see what everyone's responses are. So yes, so 42%, so almost 43% of you are returning. So welcome back and thanks so much for coming back. And about 57% of you, this is your first webinar with the Canadian Diabetes Association. So welcome and we hope you enjoy the experience and there'll be a lot of great learnings today. So um, we're looking forward to your participation. I'll move on to another polling question. And this is really just to gauge again who our audience members are. So if you can answer the following, how are you affected by diabetes? And I'll give you guys a few seconds for that. Okay, and we'll see what, uh, what our results are. Okay, so we have a majority, so about 40% of you have type 2, um, 11, just over 11% of you have type 1, 2.5% um, of you um, have children living with diabetes, um, and wow, there's 33% of you that are healthcare professionals, and about 11, just over 11% of you want to learn more about diabetes. Um, so that's so great, and we're so happy that all of you have been able to join us today. Um, I do want to welcome our speakers before I move on, um, before we move on to the presentation. I wanted to give you a bit of a background first on our first speaker, so it's Dr. Jonathan Little. Dr. Little completed his doctoral training at McMaster University and completed a postdoctoral fellowship at the University of British Columbia. He is currently an assistant professor in the School of Health and Exercise Sciences, Sciences sorry, at the University of British Columbia, Okanagan. Our second, second speaker for today is Sarah Hodson. Sarah spent the first decade of her career working for the Health Authority in coordinating and designing cardiac rehab programs. As an advocate for diabetes and exercise, Sarah has founded and is the founder program director sorry, for Live Well Exercise Clinic, and that was in 2010. And this unique clinic specializes in diabetes treatment and prevention, heart disease, obesity, and reducing risk factors like high blood pressure and high cholesterol. So for any additional information on the speakers, feel free to look at the speaker bio section, which is located on the left-hand side of your screen. So without further ado, I'd like to present to you Dr. Little. Thanks, Farah. And I want to thank everyone for, for coming. It's great to see uh, a turnout like this and, and a diverse group, and it's great to be presenting uh, with, with Sarah again. So um, I would... Uh, I would like to, I hope that I'll be able to provide something um, for everybody, knowing that we have a diverse audience, and, and it's great to see um, the healthcare professionals uh, here, because as, uh, as a professor and researcher in exercise, I know that uh, we, we don't often uh, teach our healthcare professionals about exercise, and hopefully if I get one thing across today, it might be um, a little bit about the exercise physiology, which is what my background is of why exercise um, 
is so good for someone with uh, type 2 diabetes as well as type 1 diabetes. I will say that I'll primarily focus on type 2 diabetes um, in the webinar today. Um, so I thought I'd start with some learning objectives, um, and these are hopefully what you can come away with uh, at the end of, of the presentation today. The first is to become familiar with the scientific evidence supporting the benefits of physical activity or exercise for type 2 diabetes, um, and you could short form that or, or lay person that too. How do we know exercise is good? So I know everyone probably says, oh yeah, I know about that. I know exercise, I should do it. We should be telling our patients or um, our clients to do it, but... Uh, but what is actually the scientific evidence that, that helps? Um, and sometimes when you see that scientific evidence um, for the benefits of exercise, it can actually help um, understand or, or help with some, having some facts to, uh, to say, hey, just a little bit of exercise is going to uh, have this much effect. Um, and then we're going to get a little bit more into the, the physiology and understand why exercise is beneficial for type 2 diabetes. So why does exercise work? Um, and we're going to get a, a little bit into um, skeletal muscle and, and uh, integrative physiology. And then finally, become familiar with the different types of exercise that can be beneficial um, for people that are either have diabetes or have or at risk for diabetes. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about is all exercise created equal and what exercise should I do. Um, and then uh, Sarah will, will more cover the, the practical or the more putting it into practice um, for you in her uh, second half of the talk. So let's start with that first learning objective. How do we know that exercise is good? And I'm just going to show you a, a smattering of some studies to, to help prove to you so that it's not just me saying that uh, everyone should be exercising. There actually is some very large exercise uh, research studies that have shown this. Um, so one way to, to look at the benefits of exercise is to conduct what's called a, a prospective or a longitudinal cohort study. And there's a couple of large ones that have been done in the United States. And this is one example, um, the Nurses' Health Study, where they, they would take 33,000 U.S. women um, and then they measure how much exercise they're doing right now. Um, and they do this um, with 33,000 people with a simple questionnaire asking them how many times per week they exercise. Um, so it's a very crude marker, but um, uh, what you can do in a large number of people. And then they just track them over 11 years and see um, who develops type 2 diabetes. And they can control for a whole bunch of different things, such as um, their diet and their body mass index and, and other comorbidities. Um, and you can see here, as you move from the left, those individuals that do no physical activity, they get what we call a relative risk score of one. So they're what, the, what we're comparing everybody to. And you can see a nice dose-dependent response here as we move down. One bout of exercise a week lowers your, your risk of developing diabetes by about 10%, two to four bouts a week um, by about 20%. And then you see about a 30% a reduction with four times per week. And, and it's these types of studies that we base the uh, exercise guidelines on that you should exercise on on most or all days of the week or, or if you've heard of, of people saying that um, giving you guidelines like that it's based um, largely on studies like this that show reduced risk of disease so certainly just very crudely those who say they do more exercise per week have a lower risk of developing type 2 diabetes over over a 10 or 11 year period um, getting a little bit more um, into the people that are at higher risk, because so that was in a study of 33,000 people that are across, uh, across the gamut. Some of them ha might have been at risk, some of them might not have been at risk, but it's even more powerful when you go in and, and look at people who ha are at high risk. So these are people who might have prediabetes, um, or their blood sugars are a little bit higher than normal, but they're not yet di uh, diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. And when you look here and you track um, these individuals over four years, um, again, on the, on the left-hand panel A there, you see when they do structured physical activity excluding walking. So, that, so in this study, they were trying to see if walking um, in and of itself was good. So they said excluding all the walking but going to the gym or going for a run um, or playing sports, a structured physical activity like that, you can see that those individuals who do 1 to 2.4 hours per week have about a 40% reduction in their risk of developing type 2 diabetes. Um, and you don't really get that much of an extra benefit by doing more than 2.5 hours per week. 
Um, and these are in individuals, again, who are at very high risk of developing diabetes. But then one the, the most uh, striking and the most, uh, I think, important thing is, is panel B here when you look at walking. And you can see that with just one to two and a half hours of walking per week, you get a 50% reduction in your risk of developing type 2 diabetes. So the, the key point here is with just one hour of walking a week is going to cut your risk in half um, for those people who are at high risk. And, and really, I, I think that when you see numbers like this, it can hopefully be encouraging because one hour of walking per week um, um, is probably attainable for a lot of people and certainly um, something that you could fit into your, your schedule. It's uh, you know, as little as 10 to 15 minutes uh, per day. Um, the, the research would say is going to have some benefits in reducing your risk of, of developing type 2 diabetes. Um, and then probably the best evidence we, we get is um, from a scientific perspective is when you run an actual randomized control trial. So this is when you take people that are uh, very similar and then you randomly assign them to different groups and track them over time. So here you're actually controlling the intervention. In those previous studies, you're just asking people what they do and then tracking them over time. And here you're actually doing an experiment and doing an intervention. And the, there's uh, several of these. One was done in the United States. It's called the Diabetes Prevention Program. There was a large one run in Finland and uh, one run in China and another one run in, in India, India um, all around the same time. Um, and they all had essentially the same results. And I'll just show you the, the ones from the, the U.S. data. But 3,000 people, um, and these are people with prediabetes, they were randomized to do an exercise and lifestyle intervention, 150 minutes per week of moderate physical activity. This was mostly done as walking. Um, and then they followed just very standard uh, guidelines for trying to, uh, to reduce their calorie intake, a low-fat, high-fiber diet, so very modest lifestyle changes. Um, a third of the people got metformin, which some of you are probably familiar with, or probably the most uh, widely prescribed diabetes drug in Canada. Um, and here they were giving this metformin to people with prediabetes, which isn't done very often, but they wanted to compare lifestyle to sort of our, our best first-line diabetes drug. And then the third group just got standard advice. So they, were, they didn't really get an intervention. They just said, hey, watch your diet and try to increase your physical activity um, so, because you're at risk for diabetes. And the, the key point here, when you run a study like this, um, they had to stop the study early. They were supposed to keep the study going for, um, for four or five, six years, and they had to stop it after three years because the exercise and lifestyle arm um, was so much better than the others. So it was deemed unethical to not allow the people in the metformin group or in the advice group to have access to the exercise and lifestyle intervention. So that's probably the most powerful result you can get in one of these studies, that they, they end your study early because the exercise and lifestyle was working so well. And if uh, we look at that in terms of numbers, um, the, it reduced, so the exercise and lifestyle reduced your, the chances of getting diabetes by 58% compared to um, the adv standard advice group. And this was twice as good as metformin. So metformin reduced the, the risk of developing type 2 diabetes by about 30%. And there are some, some other spin-off benefits of exercise, such as reduced blood pressure and reduced cholesterol. So now I just want to use a little polling question here just to get everyone engaged a little bit. Um, and we've all talked mostly here about prevention of type 2 diabetes. But what about if you already have type 2 diabetes? And I get asked this question a lot in some of the research studies. Um, they'll say, I'm on two different diabetes drugs and nothing seems to be working. Is exercise actually going to do anything for me? So let's see what, uh, what, what everyone thinks here. So if you already have type 2 diabetes, is exercise going to be good for you? I'll just give everyone a few moments to answer the, the question before we move on to see what the poll results say. Hopefully, we get 100% saying yes, and we, it looks like we got 99.5%, so uh, maybe one or two people there um, saying that exercise might not be good for you. But um, hopefully, I can convince you that uh, in the next couple of slides that exercise is good for you if you have type 2 diabetes, whether we look at it from a sort of long-term perspective, is this going to impact my glucose control or, or my cardiovascular risk, or just from a very short-term perspective, um, 
um, looking at what happens to your glucose levels after you do one bout of exercise. Um, so I don't have time to get into all the data. I've just pulled the, the one meta-analysis of um, experimental trials, and this is done by my colleague uh, Norm Boulay at the University of Alberta. And a meta-analysis is when um, researchers will take the results of many different studies, uh, many different clinical trials, and they pool them all together and use some fancy math to uh, statistically analyze them. And in this study, they showed that exercise training two to three times per week for about three to four months can reduce your A1C by an average of 0.66%. So some of you who are, have type 2 diabetes and go in to get your A1Cs or the health professionals, um, you would know that a reduction of 0.66% of in your A1C is, is fairly substantial. And importantly here, they showed that exercise will reduce um, your glucose levels without having an impact on body weight. So when they would control for those people who lost weight, um, exercise still had an effect. Um, and and I, that's something that I'll, I'll point to again in, in a couple more slides. Um, but certainly exercise reduces that key marker of glucose control that, that we're all um, interested in, in in terms of our diabetes management. And what about, uh, so we always look at diabetes, or most people look at diabetes from a reduction in A1C, um, and that's really because that higher A1Cs, higher glucose levels are linked with increased risk of cardiovascular disease and, and cardiovascular events. Um, so, you, so people with type 2 diabetes don't tend to, you don't uh, um, die because of high glucose, you die because of the complications of high glucose, and the major one is cardiovascular or damage to your blood vessels or your heart. And when we look here at um, pooling all the studies together to see whether exercise can reduce your risk of cardiovascular events in people with type 2 diabetes, we can see here a little bit of a trend that the moderate and vigorous exercise, and moderate exercise here is uh, would be the level of a walk, so mild exercise is more your activities of daily living, just getting up and about and moderate or vigorous exercise for someone with type 2 diabetes is, is doing a, a purposeful or structured walk. And you can see here, um, when we look, if the, the little boxes to the left, you have a reduced risk of cardiovascular events with the moderate and vigorous exercise. Microvascular events, those are going to be uh, problems with your eyes and your kidneys, where you have small blood vessels which are uh, delicate and damaged by high glucose. Again, not much of an effect of the mild exercise, but the moderate and vigorous. So if you're, if you're getting out and doing a walk, you have a, about a 20 or 30% reduced risk of having those events. And then probably the most important one, your all-cause mortality, so risk of, of dying. The mild exercise has a, has a bit of an effect, and again, the, the moderate to vigorous, reducing your risk of mortality by about 30%. So these are people that already have type 2 diabetes if they begin an exercise program. So certainly I think from a glucose control as well as a cardiovascular disease and mortality, there is scientific evidence to support exercise having benefits. And what about type 1 diabetes? So I don't have time to get into to all the benefits. The, the focus is on type 2 diabetes. Um, type 1 diabetes, again, we diagnose it using the similar criteria of elevated glucose, but the, the etiology or the, um, the reasons why are very different in type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So it means that the, um, the, the data isn't quite as clean or comparable between the two. Um, but certainly exercise in type 1 diabetes has been shown to in increase fitness. And again, my colleagues, uh, Jane Yardley from the University of Alberta um, and John McGavick have shown when you pool all the studies together in type 1 diabetes, there's uh, much less research done on exercise in type 1 diabetes than exercise in type 2 diabetes, but they've sh shown that you do get increased fitness, and increasing your fitness is one of the best uh, predictors of, of your mortality. So there's, the studies support that. There's studies supporting in type 1 diabetes that those who do more exercise have a reduced risk of death. Um, but in type 1 diabetes, it gets um, fairly difficult because we don't really have the data that exercise will improve glucose control in type 1 diabetes. Certainly it has benefits, but it, you might not see it if you're only looking at 
increased glucose. And for those of you who have type 1 diabetes or who, who um, interact with clients with type 1 diabetes, you probably know um, that when you throw exercise into the mix of insulin doses and carb counting, it can get a bit um, complicated. Um, so you might not improve your glucose control, but you might uh, reduce your insulin dose or you might adjust your insulin dose. So I think when we think about type 1 diabetes, we want to think more about the other benefits of exercise in terms of fitness and cardiovascular health um, and not tend to focus just on glucose control because the picture is, is much more complex in type 1 than type 2 diabetes when we talk about exercise and interactions with insulin. So that covers the first learning objective of uh, becoming familiar with some of the scientific evidence, and hopefully you now have a few uh, tidbits of information to, to share with others as to, to the science behind why exercise is good. Um, let's look now at why exercise works. Um, and here we have to get into a little bit of physiology, and, I, and I'm not going to get into the, the complex details, but just so we're all on the same page, um, when you consume carbohydrates or, or glucose, um, you absorb those, and glucose concentrations in the blood rise. And your pancreas detects that increase in glucose, and it secretes the hormone insulin. Insulin then binds to receptors, which are located on muscle, liver, and fat, um, other tissues as well, but those are the three main ones. And when insulin binds to those receptors, it opens up uh, a channel that allows glucose to flow into them so that uh, blood glucose goes down. And this is how it works um, in basic physiology. And in someone who is normal glycemic or doesn't have prediabetes or type 2 diabetes, this process works wonderfully well, and you maintain your glucose levels between 4 and 7 uh, millimoles per liter throughout the day, and you're very, very good at secreting insulin and sucking it up into your tissues. Um, what happens in type 2 diabetes or it starts to happen in prediabetes is that your pancreas can produce insulin just fine and actually in, in the beginning stages your pancreas is trying to compensate and it's pumping out extra insulin um, but it's like there's a wall up there for the for the insulin binding to um, the tissues and even though insulin is there it doesn't work so that means that the muscle and the liver and the fat they can't take up the glucose so you have insulin, but it doesn't work, so then the glucose levels stay high. And if we look at what tissue is, is uh, very important, about 80% of the glucose in your blood after a meal gets sucked up into your muscle. So then it becomes very important to look at how well um, insulin is working in your muscle. So we're going to focus a little bit in on muscle here. Um, and we, we say in, in sort of research terms that muscle is the largest sink for disposing of glucose. So again, 80% of the, the glucose after you consume a meal gets sucked up into your muscle. And insulin is like the key that unlocks the, the door and allows glucose to flow from the blood into the muscle. And in type 2 diabetes, and again, like I said, starting in the pre-diabetes stage, that insulin isn't working. So the ability of insulin to promote glucose um, uptake into muscle is impaired. The cool thing about this is that exercise works through an entirely different metabolic pathway. So an entirely different signaling system um, it signals for muscle to take up glucose. And this should probably make sense because when you're exercising, your muscles are contracting and they need some energy. Um, so exercise works through a different molecular pathway. It can bypass that defect in insulin signaling um, that's present and therefore allow you to take up glucose into the blood. So with that as a little bit of the physiology background that exercise can, can bypass insulin resistance, um, I have another polling question to see if, if we're understanding the physiology here. Um, and the question here is, I need to lose weight before exercise has benefits for my blood sugar and health. So I know a lot of people are fixated that exercise um, is a good weight loss tool. Um, and the question here becomes, do you need to lose weight before exercise is going to have some benefits for your blood sugar or your overall health. I'm going to give me a few more seconds to answer that. Okay, so very good. Um, well, a few people saying that uh, you do need to lose weight, but most people saying that you don't. Um, so, and I would agree with those who answered false. 
And one way we know this is by using a, a new tool called Continuous Glucose Monitoring. And this is a small little uh, device, a little electrode that's implanted under the skin in your abdomen. And it gives you uh, glucose concentrations every five minutes. Um, and we can really look here at what happens to your glucose control um, over a short period of time. Um, and when we use these devices in a research setting and track what exercise does, we can see that acutely, so right away, exercise can reduce uh, hyperglycemia in people with type 2 diabetes. So this is a nice study done. All they did is have people do a 15-minute walk, nice easy walk, after breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And you can see here that as glucose is spiking up after the meal, you go for a 15-minute walk and your glucose levels drop. And that's entirely because your muscles are sucking up the glucose because your muscles don't um, need that insulin. They can bypass the defects in insulin signaling and you lower your glucose control. So again, these effects are seen with, with very modest amounts of exercise. And you might look at what type of exercise is the best. This is work done from uh, University of Alberta as well, another Canadian research group. What they did is they had uh, patients with type 2 diabetes um, perform a 12-week exercise uh, intervention. They did either high-intensity exercise or moderate-intensity exercise, um, the H-I-I-E and M-I-C-E. And they took finger prick samples after every single bout of exercise um, that these individuals did. Um, and you can see here that their capillary blood glucose drops um, after both types of exercise, and it doesn't really matter. There's a little bit of an effect if you exercise between 30 and 60 minutes, you get a little bit more of a drop. There's no real difference between the treadmill and the bike. Um, whether you consumed food within two hours or two to six hours or six hours, the bottom line here is that exercise work to lower glucose regardless of whether the exercise was high or low intensity, treadmill or a bike, or when you last ate. So pretty powerful evidence that when you go out and do a bout of exercise, you're going to lower your blood glucose levels. Um, and I would say 90% of the time. There's sometimes when it doesn't happen um, like that, which we could maybe talk about in the questions, but by and large, you're going to get an acute reduction in glucose. Some of the work that we've done is looking at more uh, high-intensity interval training or little bursts of exercise um, where you get to go hard for a minute, picking up the pace of a walk on a treadmill, for example, and then you get a rest. And with a very low amount of exercise, just 10 one-minute bursts that we perform um, after breakfast, you can see here, again, the, the box denotes the exercise. We see a nice reduction in glucose even when the exercise intensity is high. And then the cool thing is that the exercise effects last for the next 24 hours. So even the next lunch, dinner, and the following morning's breakfast, you still have effects of exercise. So this is one mode of exercise. These people aren't losing any weight. There's no structural adaptations. It's all that effective exercise lasts for at least 24 hours to improve your blood sugars. So to summarize that, um, in Type 2 diabetes, insulin doesn't seem to work to get glucose into the blood, but exercise does. So you have immediate benefits of exercise to lower glucose. And then exercise sensitizes your muscles to the insulin so that for 24 hours, maybe 48 hours after the bout of exercise, we see uh, improvements in glucose control. So again, you exercise today, your glucose is improved on tomorrow's breakfast, um, which, is, which is a very powerful effect. And this happens regardless of whether you lose weight or not. I always like to put in a slide like this when I, when I talk and if there's any healthcare professionals because they um, always know about the side effects of different diabetes drugs, the side effects of exercise um, are also, some of them are listed here and by and large most of these are, are good side effects, not bad side effects that you would get um, with lots of our, our medical treatments. So there's some of the physiology behind why exercise might work. And uh, now I'll, I'll finish off with just uh, trying to, to chat about um, different types of exercise and how, how you might uh, be able to, um, what you might be able to do to try to, to get the benefits of exercise. Um, and we have to come back to what the Canadian Diabetes Association clinical practice guidelines recommend. And they're very general, which I think is good because it allows for a lot of flexibility. 
Um, but they say a minimum of 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous intensity aerobic exercise each week and resistance training, weightlifting or exercise with weight machines three times a week. And that might seem like a lot. Um, remember, f- for someone with type 2 diabetes, oftentimes that moderate to vigorous intensity exercise is, is walking. So this is 150 minutes of walking done per week and some resistance training. And we know you want to, to do that resistance training, one, because it benefits your glucose control, but also le- helps you hang on to some of the muscle mass that you're going to lose your aging. Um, how can you actually do that if it seems very daunting? You can start small and build up from there, and I know Sarah will talk a little bit more about that. But again, I showed you the data that short 10 to 15-minute bouts of walking can, relo- can lower your glucose. After meals is, is a, be- a good time to do this, but there's also studies showing that if you do it before a meal, you'll, you'll get some benefits. So you can really fit in these little bouts of, of walking um, throughout the day at any time point, and they're going to have benefits both at your glucose control and your long-term health. Um, oftentimes, people like to alternate their resistance training days um, with their aerobic days, and those resistance training, again, they don't have to be with weight machines. You can do that with uh, resistance bands. You can do that just with your body weight. Um, and if exercising every day doesn't fit into your lifestyle, you can combine the resistance training and the aerobic training into the same session, and that can be an effective way. And the last thing I'll talk about as I'm standing and not sitting at my computer right now, um, I have a standing desk, is uh, one thing you can do that's not quite exercise but is uh, becoming more, um, more and more research on this is avoiding sitting um, to benefit your health, particularly your glucose control. So this is just one, one study that I've uh, shown you. But if you can break up your day of sitting with very short, light-intensity activity breaks, um, you can improve your glucose control. So in this slide here, this is looking at glucose levels um, in people who are at risk for type 2 diabetes. When they sit all day, and then they have a meal, their glucose levels rise in the open boxes, and they take uh, three hours or so before they're back down to normal. If they break up every hour, they just get up three times for two minutes, and they do either light intensity, this is literally walking to the water cooler and back, or if they do moderate intensity where they actually had them get up and walk on a treadmill at a brisk pace, it didn't matter whether it was light intensity or moderate intensity, both of them were effective at lowering their glucose control. So if you do have a job or an occupation that requires sitting, um, you know it can benefit your glucose control if you just get up a couple times an hour and, uh, and move around. So with that, I'll pass it over to Sarah and uh, look forward to answering any questions near the end. Thank you so much, Dr. Little, and thank you to everybody for joining us on this Tuesday. Um, I'm going to be now speaking with you about how exactly can we now put these very important principles into our daily life and into action. And it's not always an easy thing to do. And so we want to figure out what is the best approach for us as individuals so that we can be successful at improving not only our diabetes and managing our diabetes, but improving our overall health. So I have three objectives that I'm going to speak about. And the first one is that our bodies truly were made to move. And there is so much more evidence now showing that physical activity is so much more important than sedentary living and actually is less risky than sedentary living. Um, You know, consider right now we're seeing a cyclist um, cycling on the seawall in Vancouver. And uh, if that cyclist had a cigarette in her mouth, um, we might think that uh, smoking and exercising seemed quite counterintuitive. Um, Research is telling us that sedentary living combined with exercise is also counterintuitive. So I want us to start to think that really our bodies were made to move. And so exercising is a portion of the day and active living is the remainder of the day. And the second objective that we're going to cover is really navigating the what versus the how. 
really looking at our intentions versus our behaviors. Many of us know what we should be doing, but how exactly do we do it? How do we keep doing it? And how do we make sure we're being successful at doing what we're doing? And our third objective is taking real steps to success and real steps to living well. And truly what that means is making small, sustainable changes made up of consistent decisions to change our behaviors. And we know that with making long-term lifestyle change, including being active, exercise, and even losing weight, it is about making those consistent decisions. It's truly about casting votes for ourselves towards better health. And, um, and, and that those small changes truly add up to something big. And we're able to reach our optimal health in a way that we never imagined was possible. Okay. So let's first look at, um, you know, mortality amongst different activity groups. And we really know that this is a dose-response relationship, that truly we can reduce mortality, um, all-cause all mortality, um, heart disease, cancer, and diabetes with the more that we exercise, the higher the activity level, the lower the risk of mortality. And how exactly do we get here? So we know that specifically for type 2 diabetes, we do have some modifiable risk factors, and that is being overweight or obese, that is being physically inactive, hypertension, and high cholesterol are all contributors to that diabetes picture. And the really nice thing is that exercise and active living can target all four of those. So what one method of treatment can target all four. So let's look back at 1990 and obesity rates here in North America. At that time, we didn't have as much information, um, but you can see that um, the population we have, you know, in some states and provinces, we have less than 10% of the population being obese and, and um, overweight, some 10 to 14. But let's just watch. You'll see at the top of the screen the year, and as we start to move forward from 1990, through to 1994, you start to see these pink segments coming up where, you know, we're reaching that 20%, that more than 20% of our population is obese or overweight, 1996, 98. And again, we're starting to see these colors become more vibrant. And the more vibrant the color is telling us that more of the population is living overweight or obese. So how exactly did we become so sedentary and overweight? It's a really great question and truly it's, it's not really our fault. It really is that society has created a way where we have become much more efficient in how we live our lives, but that is to the detriment of our health. So you think back, you know, we used to walk to our colleague's office, we used to take the stairs. We used to cook our own meals and wash dishes and wash the car at home in the driveway, play base baseball with our friends when we were kids, and actually mow the lawn with a um, power mower. And now, of course, we no longer have to walk to our colleague's office because we're able to quickly fire off that email. Elevators are far more accessible in public buildings than stairs. Takeout is uh, a preferred method of eating for many people. We now just have to load a dishwasher or drive through a car wash, play video games for children, or actually sit on a riding mower to mow the lawn. And so we look at the impact that that actually has on how many calories we're burning per day. And it is significant when we look at that on a daily basis, those numbers start to add up. And when we look at one pound of weight gain, one pound of weight loss equals 3,500 calories. So when we add 3,500 calories, we gain a pound. And when we take away 3,500 calories, we lose a pound. And so you can see here very quickly with about a 500 calorie difference in a week, that's one pound gained or one pound lost simply with these um, lifestyle choices. And of course, we have portion distortion. So we used to have a nice cup of coffee, 
coffee and cream, 45 calories, seemed very satisfying. And now we have this uh, beautiful cup of coffee that is laden with fat and calories for 440 calories. And so we've really changed the way society has changed the way as to how we're consuming food and how many calories we're taking in. So not only are we consuming more calories, but our sedentary living means that we are not burning as many calories. And the math in that is adding up to chronic disease. There we go, an almost 400 calorie difference. And let's be honest, most people are not having one cup of coffee a day. And it really comes back to, um, you know, our optimal default. And as I said earlier, public buildings are built now where the elevators are shiny and made of glass and have the greatest view of the facility that you're in and the escalators are like very appealing to go on. And where are the stairs? The stairs are behind a door that says stairs on it, maybe emergency exit, so people aren't sure if they can even go through the door. The stairs seem to be hidden. And if you do find the stairs, they're often in a very concrete cavern where, you know, you have to climb up and you're not really sure exactly where you're going. It's optimal default. Stairs are no longer the appealing mode for us in transportation. If we think back to old, uh, older European buildings, when you walked into these large homes and these uh, large um, mansions in Europe, when you walked in, the very first thing that you saw was a grand staircase that often broke off into two staircases to go to the upper levels of the home. And we just don't see that nowadays. So truly it is the optimal default. So when we look at energy expenditure in our lifestyle, we have to consider three key elements. And that is that we have genetics, and, and that has to do with our basal metabolic rate, absolutely. So that is, you know, something that we don't have as much control over, our age, our gender, how our hormones in our body is working for, et cetera. Um, and then we have our physiology, so how exactly our body is responding to food intake, stress, cold, um, uh, those are some examples. And then we have our environment. And our environment is about 15% of the overall picture. And it is absolutely something that we can have an impact on and make change. And interestingly, then our environment can have an uh, impact on the physiology or that thermogenesis piece. And so we can actually have an impact of about 30% through our healthy living choices. So truly genetics, physiology, and environment are a combination. It is a three-pronged approach to our disease that we cannot just look at one of those areas. But truly when we look at um, obesity, sedentary living, and diabetes, it's not your fault, but it is your responsibility for us to take initiative and start to move more and start to make better choices in the foods that we are eating. So we now know that obesity is a disease. It is not just a social condition. Um, in Canada, we now um, know that, that obesity has taken a stakehold as a disease. And we really have to start to understand. And, and as healthcare professionals, we um, need to start to really look at that weight loss is much more than eating less and moving more. We have many people in our program, uh, specifically women who are middle-aged and come to our exercise program and they make great changes. They become more active. They begin to eat much healthier foods and we don't necessarily see a change in their weight. And then all of a sudden, perhaps four to six months later, though they have changed nothing of their behaviors, they're still maintaining their healthy behaviors, all of a sudden they start to lose weight. It is a very complex calculation. It is not as simple as eating less and moving more. And I hope that that resonates for some of our listeners today that if you are making strides forward to healthy behaviors, please be patient with the process. I always say the faster you lose the weight, the faster you gain it back. So please know that it is a process. Um, there is no simple solution solution for um, for obesity and for 
for the combination of diabetes and obesity. And I think that um, Dr. Little brought up a, an absolutely um, fabulous fact, and that is that we don't have to lose weight and become slim people to be healthy. Um, physical activity is a primary indicator of improved health. And in fact, you don't have to lose weight to improve your diabetes. And I really want that to be a key message for people to take home today. Attitude is everything. Please change the way that we are thinking about obesity and diabetes. So what is the best approach for us to make lasting change? And truly, it's about finding the why. And uh, Dr. Little and I had the opportunity to be at a professional conference last week, and I was at a, a talk that they were able to present some very interesting statistics that the American College of Sports Medicine was able to pull from the, uh, um, from the American population. And really it was about why is it that we exercise? And when people didn't have the right why, they were very short-term successful. So what exactly does that mean? Well, we know the benefits of exercise, and it's not about that we don't know these points. You know, we know that exercise can lower our blood sugars. And again, as Dr. Little said, for 24 to 48 hours after a bout of exercise, um, we can still see lowered blood sugars. And of course, a reduced A1C. Um, and exercise does also lower our blood pressure. So when we look at exercise, actually blood pressure is such an immediate effect. And in a society where we really are looking for instant feedback, um, that blood pressure piece is something that we can truly look at to know that we've been successful in that moment. Again, it doesn't have to be a long bout of exercise. It can be shorter, high-intensity um, bouts of exercise, or it could per perhaps be a 10-minute moderate walk, and you could see a reduction in your blood pressure. And again, a reduction in blood pressure is good for anywhere from about 13 to 24 hours after your bout of exercise. We see lowered cholesterol, specifically lowered triglycerides and LDL cholesterol, which is our bad cholesterol. And we see an increase in our HDL cholesterol, which is our healthy cholesterol. And we do know that exercise does help us to lose weight, although, again, that is a complex issue. And some other really important pieces I didn't want to leave out is that exercise makes us feel good. It reduces depression and anxiety. It improves our overall health. And it does improve our risk of chronic health, health conditions. But what we know is that the why cannot necessarily be these items. We can't start exercise with the why of, well, I really want to reduce my risk of heart disease. I really want to manage my diabetes. Because how are we measuring that? And how are we knowing that we are actually warding off some type of future health complication? When we don't feel an immediate sense of gratification, we quit. And so I want to make sure that today people feel inspired and enabled to continue exercise long term. So these are great, great reasons for why we exercise, but it shouldn't be your reason as to why you exercise. These are the benefits of what you're doing. And so let's look into more of that why. Um, here's a, a look at uh, hemoglobin A1C changes in uh, a structured exercise program. And so I know that on purpose this chart is um, meant to look a little bit overwhelming, but I have made a very good conclusion on the next slide, and that is the very top line here. We can see that um, the overall impact of exercise can reduce our A1C by about one point. So why should we exercise? And again, I really want to stress that not all whys are the correct reason why. Why we do things is what leads to the motivation as to how we're going to do it. And how we do our exercise truly starts to put into place the priority that our lifestyle changes have in our life, and then we are able to actually do it. So. For some people, you know, it's really about training for their 70s, 80s, and 90s to live the life that you dreamed you'd be living. 
But if you right now are, you know, under the age of 70, perhaps 70 seems a little bit far off for you, or if you're 70, 80 seems far off for you, or if you are 80, 90 seems a little bit too far ahead. And again, you're not going to get that instant gratification of exercise. Um, specifically, we know that women make about 70% of their household health care decisions. And so women truly, truly are the catalysts for change in their families. But more than that, women actually need to give themselves permission to exercise. Women need to feel that they have that permission, that time away, because women naturally are nurturers. And no matter how old their family is, no matter how old their spouse is or their, um, their children, women tend to care for other people before they care for themselves. And if you're a, a female listening to um, this webinar today, I hope that resonates with you, that truly as women, we have to give ourselves permission to lead healthier lives and make healthy decisions for ourselves because we are impacting 70% of our family's healthcare decisions. And not only that, but women actually state that they receive most of their healthcare advice from other women and women are two times more likely to give healthcare advice to their girlfriends. So a very important catalyst for change, again, is women in our community, and that can be a, a huge um, impact for our families, um, but it truly is about giving yourself permission to be active. Um, planning our exercise is a huge component of success, and again, if we don't plan, then we plan to fail. So knowing when am I going to be exercising, how does this work into my week ahead, and truly scheduling it in until it becomes a habit where you know exactly when you're going to be exercising every day because we know that our motivation reduces as the day goes on. And as the day goes on, we come, become less and less motivated to be active. And our sedentary living increases as the day goes on. And so a great choice for exercising is to exercise earlier in the day, if possible, um, to make sure that you're able to not only have self-talk that talks you out of exercising, but have truly the greatest motivation to do it. But in order to find the right why, we want to know what's important to you as an individual and where do you see your health a year from now. So this truly comes down to what are your personal values. And those are going to be the reasons as to why you make healthy lifestyle changes. Is it parenting, grandparenting, that family aspect? Is that a very key component of a value of you as a person? Perhaps it's looking at recreation and leisure and going out and being able to do things that bring you joy. Tai Chi, golfing, fishing. Perhaps it's relationships, whether it's with spouses, children, uh, children, in-laws, uh, companions, people in your community and neighborhood. Perhaps that's something that is very, very valuable to you as an individual. So taking some time to really think about what are your values? Why is it that you want to have a legacy of health? Why is it that you want to improve your health and, and become more active? Because if we don't truly know the why, then research actually indicates to us that at about the three-month mark, we will quit exercise. So I want us to uh, to consider an example here where uh, we have somebody who starts exercise and their why is truly around the feeling of exercise. So they go to their doctor and their doctor says, you know, um, Sam, I'd really like you to become more active. Um, you know, you have a family history of diabetes, you've, uh, your weight is up by 20 pounds, and you're now borderline hypertensive. Um, Sam, you need to go and exercise. Sam, why would you like to um, exercise? What is your reason? Why do you feel that this would benefit you? And Sam says, you know what? My energy is down. I don't feel in control of my life. Um, my mood is decreased. I just want to feel better. And Sam's reason behind exercising is that he wants to feel better. 
But in the room right next door, we have Hannah, and Hannah's doctor gives her the exact same story. Risk factors are increasing. There's a couple little clinical conditions that are starting to make their way um, into her life. Maybe her blood cholesterol is up. Hannah, why do you want to lose weight? And Hannah says, I want to improve my health and I want to lose weight. And so we have these two individuals who have both been told by their doctor that activity is an important element of their life. But three months later, when we go and visit them, Sam is continuing to exercise and Hannah has quit. And why Hannah quit? Hannah has quit because... She didn't get to see any results. Three months later, she didn't really know if her health had improved. Her cholesterol had really stayed about the same. She hadn't lost any weight, and she felt very down about that. But when you were able to talk to Sam, Sam felt better. Sam felt more energy. He did feel happier. He felt that his mood had increased. And therefore, we really need to redefine health from a less clinical perspective when it comes to our community, to our patients, and to people living with diabetes, is health is about being able to do what you want, when you want, and to feel great doing it. So ultimately, we want people to feel great. And again, this same survey that the American College of Sports Medicine did in the U.S. showed that people adhered to exercise when they felt that it was benefiting them, when they felt good. So truly, how you feel when you're exercising versus the value of what exercise is. It's feelings versus logic. We have presented a lot of logical reasons as to why you should exercise, but those reasons will not keep you exercising. It truly has to be that exercise is something that makes you feel better. And to even follow up that survey, um, the American College of Sports Medicine sent out three different text messages to a large population of people. And the first text message looked at health benefit. So it would say, if you exercise today, you are likely to reduce your blood pressure by 5 to 7%. The second text message said, if you exercise today, you will increase your energy and improve your mood. And the third text message had a combination of those two messages. And the text message that was the most impactful and that people felt the most motivated by and saw the most success was the second text message that reminded people that exercise makes them feel good. And I think that that is a very important take-home message today. In order for us to truly be successful, we do need to share and declare why we are exercising. And that comes down to setting some very important goals. So when you are setting your goals, you want to consider these support mechanisms partnering with a team of healthcare professionals for that support and that long-term cheerleading. Exercise is not something that everybody enjoys, and exercise is not something that is always fun. However, it does make people feel a lot better. In the beginning, exercise can feel uncomfortable. Exercise can bring about some aches and pains. Exercise can make us feel warm and sweaty and and perhaps some feelings that we haven't felt before. And I think it's very important to note that many of those things are normal for the first six six to eight weeks. Our uh, temperature self-regulation is going to be a little bit off, especially if you're someone who's overweight or obese. Exercising really starts to increase your temperature and you do start to sweat and it can feel very uncomfortable. And also it's asking your joints to do things that they haven't done in quite some time. So definitely to have that support from some healthcare professionals is key. Um, Practice using your exercise and nutrition to improve your diabetes. And, you know, it's really interesting to see even just how does exercise improve your blood sugars, you know, before exercise and after exercise. And so even if you're someone who doesn't have to test your blood sugars, um, throughout the day, do this around exercise just to prove to yourself that, you know, exercise truly is benefiting you. Take a pre-exercise blood sugar and then exercise and wait about 10 minutes. And and when I exercise, it could be a moderate walk around the block for 10 to 15 minutes. Come home, take a seat for a few minutes and retest your blood sugars and likely they will have gone down. Um, You do see that your heart has and this is immediate feedback 
feedback as an individual that will, um, you know, spur you forward to continue to be motivated with exercise. Wear a heart rate monitor. Um, use some wearable technology. Nowadays, we have things like Fitbit and um, different uh, items out there. There's polar um, wearable technologies. There's, you know, a whole department of them now in electronic stores where you can go and actually get some feedback about is your heart becoming healthier and stronger and if it is you're going to see a couple things you're going to see that your resting heart rate over time will actually decrease so when you start exercising your resting heart rate is about 80 and as the weeks and months go on you start to notice that your resting heart rate is maybe in the 60s as well as you start to see that you're recovering from your exercise bouts much more easily than you were in the beginning, meaning that your heart rate is coming down at a better pace and not staying elevated. And that really tells us that your heart is able to compensate and go through those changes of warm up and cool down in a healthier way. So a way that you can also measure your blood pressure is that you can uh, walk to a local grocery store or pharmacy where they have the blood pressure cuffs, take your blood uh, pressure, and then just go for a 10-minute walk and go again and take a seat in that, uh, in that pharmacy and measure your blood pressure again and see that those numbers actually have gone down. And again, exercise reduces our anxiety and depression. How do we know this? This is something where you could record your mood and your energy before and after your bout of exercise. And I even encourage you that around all of your lifestyle changes, that you start to look at what is your mood and your energy around that lifestyle change. And what we have people in our program doing is when they're making healthier eating choices, even measuring their mood and energy around that eating. And so I'll give the example of nighttime snacking, which, you know, for many of us is a difficult um, behavior to change. And so on the nights that you're able to uh, reduce your nighttime snacking or cut it out, how do you feel that evening? What is your mood? What is your energy? What is your mood and energy an hour after? Then measure it on the days that you actually do snack and look at your mood and energy and really start to make an assessment of, is it worth it for us to have that nighttime snack? So this can, um, this can be very relevant even outside of exercise. A really important point that, that I can't emphasize more is that this truly is a journey. If you are looking for instant gratification through instant results, and if you are absolutely driven by outcomes, when we base our success on numbers, we are actually basing our success on something we have no control over. We want to base our success on our behaviors. And truly, our behaviors are the only things that we have control over. And so when we set those small goals that are going to help us win, those goals are behavior goals. Those goals are not, I want to reduce my A1C by one point, or I want to reduce my fasting glucose, or I want to reduce my weight. Those goals are three months from now, I want to see myself consistently taking my lunch to work with me instead of eating out. Three months from now, I want to see myself consistently getting in 150 minutes of exercise a week. Three months from now, I want to see myself consistently eating breakfast. Those are the types of goals we want to be setting and not setting ourselves up based on numbers. And a huge part of our success is being part of a community. Our human nature is drawn to other people. And truly, we know that people who exercise with other people, exercise in groups, exercise with friends, typically they have uh, a, a specific time that they're meeting at. It keeps them more accountable. And that community engagement is really important. And it also takes our mind off that, you know, we are having to, um, to exercise if you're someone who doesn't exactly enjoy the behavior of exercising. So three simple steps here. So you definitely want to um, visit your doctor and discuss exercise. Here in BC, we do have a prescription for exercise. Um, throughout Canada, there are other provinces who have picked this up where you can get a $50 grant towards starting exercise in an exercise program. 
um, start in a supportive, accountable environment, such as a community center or a specific diabetes program. You really want to make sure that it's somewhere who understands you, your needs, your complexities as an individual, and is able to modify your exercise program as necessary. And about, again, sharing and declaring, what is your why? What are your reasons for exercising? Is it because you want to be able to do what you want when you want and feel great doing it? And that includes, you know, attending your granddaughter's wedding this summer and you want to be able to dance on the dance floor because that's a meaningful moment in your life. That's fabulous. And those are the types of things that you need to share, not that you want to lose 10 pounds or improve your A1C. Likely the behaviors that are going to get you to your granddaughter's wedding are also going to do the other things that like lose weight and improve your A1C, however you want to focus on your behaviors. And a really important thing is to offer yourself forgiveness. We, we have built ourselves up on the guilt that we fail sometimes because we take an all or none approach to lifestyle change. And I really want you to think again that sustainable lifestyle change is made up of consistent decisions. It's like casting votes. The more votes you cast towards a healthy lifestyle, the more likely you are to adopt that lifestyle long term. So if one day you don't cast a vote, that's okay. We're not taking a vote away. Just the next day, you do cast a vote towards healthy living by making that choice to go for your walk or to make some better eating choices. And constantly remind yourself of why you're doing this. You know, I, I really recommend writing it down and posting it somewhere on your bathroom mirror, on your fridge, where you feel reminded of it on a daily basis. Um, in our program at Live Well, um, our participants every week take home this little piece of paper and they post it in their house. And it really says, I choose to, and that's where they list their specific behavior. What is the specific behavior they're choosing to do this week so that I can, and then they list what they're striving for three months from now. So for example, I choose to walk 150 minutes this week so that I can dance with my granddaughter at her wedding. I am confident. How confident are you at reaching this goal? We know that we want our confidence to be about a 7, 8, or a 9 out of 10, and that rating our confidence anything lower than that is going to mean that we are likely to not be successful at reaching this weekly goal. And then down on the lower portion is the accountability. Did I do it on the days that I scheduled? And so um, just stressing some things again that Dr. Little pointed out earlier in our webinar is that low physical fitness is as strong a risk factor for mortality as smoking. And we talked about that with the, the picture of the cyclist at the um, beginning of my portion of the talk. Um, but also that fitness level is one of the strongest predictors of all-cause all -cause mortality in people with diabetes. So focusing on being active is a very, very important part of this as we know that people who are physically active are actually seeing improved health returns. Um, physical activity can be as powerful as glucose-lowering medications, but with much fewer side effects. Um, and Dr. Little actually listed those side effects, which, if you remember, were all very positive. Regular physical activity in conjunction with healthy eating and weight control can reduce the diabetes incidence by 60%. Those are very strong numbers that we want to remember, but we're just wanting to remember those because though if we use these numbers as motivation for exercise, our exercise will be short term. So the recommendation of the amount of exercise from the CDA, and Dr. Little and I have touched on this a couple times, so I hope that we get some good solid answers here. How many minutes per week do you believe to be the prescription in Canada for exercise? And I'll give people a few moments to answer that. Good job. Wow, we have a, a bunch of smart people on our hands here today. Thank you so much for listening to us. Um, absolutely 150 minutes a week is the prescription that the Canadian Diabetes Association, um, and, and again, that is backed up by research. So let's move forward to, to truly see how can we do this, and let's specifically talk about those recommendations. 
And I think that, again, that word recommendation is a very um, important word for us to stress. It is that. It is a recommendation, which gives us some wiggle room. We also know from research that you have to enjoy moving to actually get up to your 150 minutes. So if that means that um, dancing in your living room is the way that you enjoy moving to get your heart rate up and to get in those 150 minutes, we want you doing activities that you enjoy. So this, again, is just a framework to work within. If it means that you are able to take some breaks in your day and get, you know, a few minutes of higher intensity exercise in, or if you're able to get a 10-minute walk in three times a day, those are all very powerful tools for you to be successful. But please know that this is a recommendation, and if you are currently inactive, this recommendation is a very lofty goal, and I recommend we start much lower than that if you are someone who is inactive at this time. I want to also point out that it's only in recent years that um, we have included the recommendation of resistance training into the guidelines. And that is saying about two to three um, days of resistance training a week. It is beneficial if you're able to give your body a day of rest between those um, days of resistance training, completing about eight to ten exercises um, of anywhere from two to three sets of eight to twelve repetitions. And again, you are going to want to seek out a, um, a, a professional who is likely a healthcare professional who specializes in diabetes and exercise to help you out with getting those um, those exercises. But you can find someone at your community center um, who could help you out. Just make sure that they understand your medical history. So let's look at what you're doing today and this past week so that we actually know how we can move forward. And, you know, what we are doing, what we say we're doing, and what we should be doing are three different things. So we want to be very honest in this. What is it that we are doing today? And I want us to specifically be talking about exercise, where we're getting our heart rate up. We're starting to feel a bit of a sweat. We feel our temperature rising, and we feel a bit of breathlessness coming on. What are you doing? So if you're doing 20 minutes a week right now, aim for 25. Don't go from 20 minutes to 150 because the reality is, is that you're going to likely fail or it's only going to be short-term success. And the more we fail, the harder it is to pick ourselves up and keep going. Another thing is that you could pr probably try to walk slightly faster for five minutes of every 10 minutes. And that's another way that you can keep modifying your exercise program to keep it interesting. Change the route that you're walking. Change, uh, you know, walk with different groups of people, not always the same group of people. Keep it interesting for yourself. Do the things that you enjoy the most because ultimately you will keep on doing them if you enjoy them. Remember that research tells us it's how you feel when and about exercise that is actually going to keep you doing it. Um, have you ever performed resistance training? Please do talk to your doctor before you uh, get involved in any type of activity if you are um, currently inactive so that they can make the best recommendations for this. But remember that we don't need to solve um, yesterday today. So this is a screenshot of the CDA website, and I do recommend that you um, go to diabetes.ca to look at these um, guidelines. And this just goes over, again, moderate and vigorous um, exercise, that we do want to be doing more vigorous exercise for about 150 minutes a week. You know, uh, the... Um, the prescriptions here are saying 50 to 70% and greater than 70%. What exactly are those percentages and how do we get them? And there is a way that you can um, calculate a general um, heart rate. However, it is preferred that um, if you are someone with diabetes that you have a um, treadmill assessment um, by your doctor. Um, it can be called an exercise tolerance test or a graded exercise test or a um, cardiac stress test where you go on a treadmill and you actually learn what your maximum heart rate is for you as an individual. And the reason that I say that is that people with diabetes have a blunted heart rate response meaning that oftentimes we can overestimate what the target heart rate zone is for you as someone living with diabetes than, say, a uh, person with a history of heart disease. 
So that 50 to 70 percent, um, if you're not really sure what that is for you as an individual or you don't have access to that type of a treadmill assessment, then you want to think of uh, moderate exercise as continuous movements like dancing, brisk walking, swimming, for example. And that vigorous exercise greater than 70 percent is definitely brisk walking where you've now included hills. Maybe you've included some jogging or some type of sport into your um, daily activities. And then as we move into resistance training, again, that can be using um, free weights, resistance bands, weight machines. It may in the beginning be um, starting off with using your body weight as, as the resistance for many of these exercises. But I really recommend you speaking with um, a fitness professional about that um, as if you've never participated in resistance training exercises, um, it, it is a complex approach. And so um, we want to make sure that you're safe and also to reduce injury you want to make sure you have some expert advice there. So this is Mel, and he um, is a lifelong exerciser. He started in 2010. And Mel is someone who um, is a 60-year-old male with type 2 diabetes. And see, he says here, I knew what I should be doing, but I didn't know how to do it. And if you remember back in the beginning of our discussion here, we talked about the disconnect between our intentions and our behaviors. We know what we should be doing, but how do we do it? And he found that accountability and motivation in a group were things that he needed in order for him to be successful at an exercise program. And truly, when we actually start to put exercise as a priority in our life, that we actually feel like we need to do it every day as part of our lifestyle, that's when we know that exercise has truly been integrated. And oftentimes, we see people, and let's think back to Sam, who we talked about earlier. Sam had been to his doctor, and his doctor had told him to exercise, and he wanted to exercise because he wanted to feel good. And three months later, he was continuing to exercise because he felt good. But six months later, he went back to his doctor, and he was no longer exercising. And why was that? That was because Sam let the priorities of his life take over his own self-care and his own self-care, including exercise, his priorities as a father, his priorities as a coach and as a husband and as a community volunteer. They started to take precedence over exercise. And it was really that Sam didn't understand that exercise is a fuel that keeps the car running and that truly when he wasn't able to fuel that's what brought him to wanting to start exercise because he was sick of feeling low in energy, energy, low in mood, and he was sick of being behind that car on the road and pushing that car forward and feeling that leg behind in life. And when he started exercising, he was able to sit in the driver's seat, take control of his life, and fuel his car with exercise, and life went better. But six months later, when all these other priorities started to take place, Sam found himself pushing his car again. And really it's about us understanding that active living is a priority and that when life gets busy, when we pull active living out of, the, out of our life, we start pushing the car again and we start to see a reduction in mood, a reduction in energy, and we stop feeling good. And so when we really look at that reason of feeling good and here in Mel's situation, he got to the point where exercise became a natural process for him on a daily basis. And truly that's because he understood he needed exercise exercise in his own self-care. We've talked about forgiveness. Please know that this is not about perfection, and, and I am, I'm very aware of our time here, so I want to move through these last few slides quite quickly. But we were born to be real. We were not born to be perfect, and that is not an expectation of this process. It is about doing your best not feeding on the on the guilty negative thoughts because those are self-destructive behaviors, but instead choose to learn from making those mistakes. How can you do things better? I believe that we've likely talked about most of these points here, surrounding ourselves with people with a common goal and choosing things that we enjoy are going to make us the most successful.
again, that feedback of a pedometer or wearable technology, and just setting small goals of increasing your steps. Could I do 100 more steps today than I did yesterday, or maybe 250 or 500, but including more activity in our day outside of our exercise so that we actually, that our optimal default is the stairs, so that our optimal default isn't finding the closest parking spot. It's finding that area where we maybe have to walk a little bit, but truly we are including active living in our lifestyle. Setting our goals has to be very specific. If our, if our goals are not specific, we are highly likely to not be successful. They need to be specific. So Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 8.30 is very specific. It's measurable to do it in 30 minutes. Is this a realistic measurement for this person? They've said who they're meeting with, rain or shine. They've set parameters. So it's very clear if they're um, consistent and successful with this or not. Physical exercise is safer than being sedentary, and we only see complications occur in about one of every 100,000 hours of exercise. In, in, in my 15-year career, I have only seen one critical incident um, in our clinics, and it was a non-fatal um, incident. And so exercise absolutely is a safe modality for improving our health. Um, again, when we looked at reducing our A1C, uh, aerobic training takes about half a percent, or resistance training takes that other half of a percent, reducing our A1C in total by 1%. And we talked about that earlier, but that's the breakdown of why we now include aerobic training and resistance training into our exercise lifestyle. Great. Thank you so much, Sarah. And thanks again, Dr. Little. You guys have shared um, some really amazing information with us on the importance of exercise, especially for people living with diabetes. Now, folks, I know we're definitely over time here, and I do appreciate all of you guys that have been able to stay on for the remainder of the presentation. Um, we have just about five to seven minutes here for Q&A, um, so we'll, we'll get those kind of answered as soon as possible. Um, so with that being said, I'll start off with our first question, and then between yourself, Sarah, and between Dr. Little, you guys can, um, I guess, decide who'd like to, to take a stab at the question. Um, so for the first one here, we have one of the participants asking, what type of exercise would you recommend for a patient with severe arthritis? I'll, I'll maybe take that one, Dr. Little. Um, sure. So for, again, this is about finding activities that allow us to be successful and moving in a way that works for our body. So someone who has severe arthritis, I absolutely would recommend if they are a new exerciser and and that I'm more inactive, that we're finding exercises that are non-weight-bearing, that take the load off of the joints. When we have people um, who start exercise with arthritis, it absolutely is a six- to eight-week process before people start to feel comfortable. And I want to give that information because oftentimes people start exercise with arthritis, they get a bit of a flare-up, and they feel that exercise doesn't work for them. And actually, exercise is medicine for arthritis, and I can't stress that more. It's about moving in your, your body in a way that works. When your joints haven't been worked for quite some time, yes, they are going to flare up a little bit and not feel as good, but that effect goes away after six to eight weeks. But finding things like perhaps a recumbent bicycle or the pool or water walking are really great ways for people with um, arthritis to start exercising. But it's so important to actually start with strengthening those muscles. And again, I really recommend learning some exercises that you can do from a seated position so that you are taking the load off of the joints and strengthening those muscles around the knee, strengthening those muscles around the hip so that when you actually go and start to do more weight-bearing exercises or when you actually do move to the recumbent bike, that your muscles and joints are more prepared for that type of an activity. Great. Thank you so much for that response. I'll move on to a next question from one of our participants. They've asked, can leg cramps be a result of insulin not being absorbed into the muscles? Um, maybe I'll take that one. Um, I 
the short answer there would be no. Um, insulin is is uh, technically not absorbed into the muscle. Insulin binds to the receptor on the muscle. Um, but but I, I'm unaware of any scientific evidence that would would kind of link. Um, insulin resistance in your legs with with cramps so we don't really know um have a good idea on what causes leg cramps and whether those are happening with exercise or not whether it's nerve neuromuscular or electrolytes but i would say it's not related to to your to insulin or insulin resistance and uh, unless sarah you've heard anything different on that completely agree Great, thank you so much for that response. Um, I'll move on to the next question. One of our participants have asked, I often run 5K distances and since I have diabetes, I feel very dizzy at the end of the run. What can I do to avoid this? Um, I, can, I can take this one. Sure. And then, then maybe Dr. Little, you can add in um, your opinion also. Um, you know, oftentimes it's about, um, I would recommend that taking, actually testing your blood sugar just for a short term, maybe for a week at times during that, that run. And it may be that you need to actually take a snack so that your blood sugars don't get lower. Um, another impact that could be contributing to the dizziness is blood pressure. And um, so just making sure that at the end there's an adequate cool down of not just running and stopping but perhaps needing to just start to jog for a few minutes and progressing to a brisk walk and therefore progressing to, um, to a walk. So there's two components there that could be contributing to that dizziness. But it, if it is something that, um, that is concerning, then absolutely speaking with our doctor about it would, would be recommended. But I'd love to hear Dr. Little's contribution there too. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. So we... we um always in our research studies are, are taking finger prick samples before and after um, to look at that. If you're, not, if you're type 1 diabetic and or type 2 on insulin, um, having a hypoglycemic event or a low blood sugar is, is more of an issue. We really don't see that unless you're on a, a drug called glyburide and you combine that with exercise. Um, so my, my guess, unless, um, unless you're on insulin, would be um, it's, it's probably a blood pressure thing, and, and we often see, you can see that that you get uh, post-exercise hypotension. So um, the cool down is very effective there, and, and if um, you have access to a, to a health professional who could maybe measure your blood pressure before and after exercise and on a couple occasions, just to try to see that that might uh, might be an idea. Great, thanks so much for that response. Um, so just another few minutes here, guys, um, and, and we'll get to as many questions as possible. Um, but for the questions that we do not get to, please email us at webinars at diabetes.ca, and we'll do our very best to get your questions answered uh, in a timely fashion. Our next participant has asked, they have a diabetic foot ulcer. Would you recommend them to exercise, or should they not exercise? Um, maybe I'll, I'll hop in first, and then Sarah can probably can probably speak to that. And you know, I we deal with fairly healthy type two diabetics who are in our research studies because they have to have be free of uh, of peripheral neuropathy and any things like that. So, um, but certainly exercise is going to be effective. And, and like kind of with the question related to the um, osteoarthritis. Um, is you just got to find something that's going to work for you. So, you know, there, there's lots of exercise you could do in a seated position and, and something with a foot ulcer might be something, a, a perfect thing for doing a lot of resistance band type of exercise training um, where you can do that in a seated position, not putting pressure on, on the ulcer in that. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with that. Um, and, you know, in our program, we... Um, one thing we would recommend in that situation is absolutely checking the foot both before and after exercise and just um, doing a visual check um, and a, a touch check um, to that area just to make sure that um, that there is no infection setting in and that the, the um, sore looks okay. Um, you know, I... Um, I, I absolutely agree that there's all different types of exercises. And again, it's about moving your body in a way that works at that time. And so it's about finding somebody who can be very creative with you um, and, and help you move, but also making sure that your self-care um, is very prevalent in that situation so that um, infection and, and so forth doesn't um, progress. 
Great. Thanks so much. So I have one last question here. Um, one of our participants has asked, does walking at a comfortable pace give the same benefit of a sweat-producing treadmill session? Um, so maybe I'll take that because we're uh, our first. And um, the there's no simple answer to that, but but the good answer is that, yes, walking at a comfortable pace um, can give you the same glucose-lowering effect um, as as a sweat producing treadmill session and and there's lots of things that are going to come into play and as a as a geek scientist we would run studies and try to control the amount of calories you burn versus in the walk versus the run for example and actually in the studies that do that the longer walk seems to be better for glucose than the shorter run if i could summarize them all um, there's some possible benefits of going harder in terms of your cardiovascular fitness so that's where probably bringing in uh, both if you can, um, but if the comfortable pace walk is what you like to do um, and you dislike that sweat-producing treadmill session, you can certainly be confident that you're going to get um, benefits, particularly for your glucose control from the comfortable walk. Great. Thanks so much for that response. Um, so that does conclude our webinar for today. I'd like to sincerely thank you, Dr. Jonathan Little and Sarah Hodson, for speaking on behalf of the Canadian Diabetes Association. It's definitely been a really great learning experience. Um, I just want to remind you folks that our webinars will be available on our CDA website. Um, so feel free to come to our website within the next few weeks, and our sessions will be up and available for you to participate and in, to view. Um, I wanted to send a quick thank you out to everyone who attended today and for your patience and for staying on the call. It's been great. Um, and also to our wonderful volunteers who have coordinated this session. We do have one last webinar for this series, which is, will be next week on June the 10th. And the session is really going to be about goal setting. So small, small steps lead to big results. So we do hope that you'll participate and join us on that one. For any of you guys um, that are interested in any sponsorship opportunities, please email us at webinars at diabetes.ca. Um, we will have a new virtual health coaching program here at CDA. So for more information on this um, program that's coming soon, please email us at one or call us rather, sorry, at 1-800-MANTING. And if you'd enjoy the webinar today and you'd like to make a donation, please visit our website at diabetes.ca or call us at 1-800-MANTING. Thanks so much, and we hope you all have had a great session as much as we did. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.